those of you that are new to our bootcamp, um, there is an option to um, write messages on our chat room. Uh, so if you have any question uh, related to anything that is said or presented uh, in our uh, bootcamp, you can write it down on the uh, meeting chat. That will be uh, the uh, chat uh, icon on your the conversation icon on your um, uh, tool set there uh, in the uh, Teams meeting. So um, let's uh, start with this fourth uh, session and um, see if we have any questions on the previous um, session, which we uh, covered the uh, risk assessment, risk analysis, both quantitative and qualitative risk analysis. Um, so no questions in our chat room, so uh, we will start talking about the uh, from the point that uh, we stopped last week. So last week, just to give us a short reminder, uh, we talked, uh, we, we ended, we completed the uh, session talking about KRIs and KRIs, if you don't remember, are kind of the sensors that we have uh, or indicators that we have for a change in the overall risk. Um, the KRIs are very important for us to manage the risks, but they're not uh, something accurate that we can rely on in terms of monetary or financial uh, values. Now, talking about the residual risk, the residual risk is something that management is practically responsible of directing. So there is the total risk, which we all agree that we can identify the risk qualitative or quantitative, but at the end of the day, the risk is presented to management and management needs to decide what to do with the risk. So we will get to that shortly on the four options that management has uh, on uh, addressing the risks. But once management decided to address the risk and mitigate that risk, so it'll direct the teams uh, to implement certain controls and to mitigate on a control gap until a certain point that the risk is now becoming an acceptable risk for management. So it's not for us to see SSPs, and it's very important to um, to keep that in mind when, when you're in the exam. It's the risk that is acceptable for the management. Um, so basically the total risk, as you can see here, the total risk, if we uh, take from the total risk, the, the control gap or, or or the amount of control that we're willing to implement in order to address that risk or, or any any uh, family of risks or categories of risks uh, gives us the residual risk. This is the, the risk that we are left with after implementing the safeguards. Now, if you look at this map, I put together the map or the graph for how we uh, uh, envision the, the risk itself. Uh, on one hand, on the Y column, you see the probability. On the X column, you see the impact. And the curve that we have between the two separates the acceptable risk or the risk appetite of the organization from the excessive risk. The curve itself is actually the risk tolerance. So the risk tolerance is, again, management decision on what they can tolerate as a risk and that risk tolerance has a certain depth to it so certain risks can touch the risk tolerance from the acceptable risk uh, 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 side and certain risks will touch the risk tolerance uh, from the excessive risk but all these risks will eventually have some sort of a plan on how to address them and again this is a management decision so if we look at the risk glossary, if we look at all the risks that we have in the organization, some of them will be under the risk appetite and some of them will be excessive risks. Um, if we decide to handle a risk, then we take into consideration all the variables related to that risk. And if you go back to the risk formula, which we have the R equals I times P. The, so here we can see it's, it's quite the opposite, but it's the same equation of the R equals threat times vulnerabilities, which is the probability, the probability itself, and then times the asset value. The asset value is practically the impact that we have, and the impact can be quantitative or qualitative. So 
given the fact that we have some sort of a risk and we decide to address it. So going back to the control gap, the control gap is the amount of um, uh, 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 controls that we are willing or management is willing to invest in order to bring this risk down to the acceptable level. In this case, management decided to invest money, time, any type of resource in order to bring the probability down. So the impact stay the same, but the probability of this event or this risk to take place to get materialized dropped down from the excessive risk map to the uh, acceptable risk area. And, and again, going back to the residual risk, the residual risk is the total risk minus control gaps. So again, management has basically four ways of addressing risks. And remember, this is again management decision. So when you when you have this type of questions in your exam, this is not for you as a CISSP to decide on what to do with the risks. This is management decision. You are merely the consultant slash advisor slash the, the, the one of the team of the management senior management, you can be part of senior management in the question, but it's not your decision. It's everybody's uh, on senior management decision. And if we cannot make a decision in senior management, then it's the CEO's decision in your um, uh, questions. So the CEO, bear in mind that the CEO is the ultimate risk owner of any organization. So management can address the risks in four different ways. The first way is to mitigate the risks. Mitigating the risks is simply implementing controls, any type of controls, and we can have administrative controls, technical controls, or physical controls, as mentioned before. Then again, management can decide on certain risks to transfer them. So the, the, the term transferring risks is not accurate as it is, but in the CISSP, we call it transferring the risks, even though we actually transfer some of the impact. So by buying an insurance, which is the category of transferring the risk, by buying the insurance, the insurance will participate with us on the level or, or the, the, the financial level of impact. Um, so if let's say we lost 100 Ks in a certain event and a certain risk that got materialized, the payment from the insurance will be, I don't know, 90, 95 uh, uh, Ks. But the fact that the insurance participated with us in the impact doesn't mean that they now own the risk. So again, remember that in your CISSP, buying an insurance co coverage is transferring the risk, okay? And then management can decide on accepting the risk. This, accepting the risk means that this is a risk that we can live with. We, we, even, even if it gets materialized, even, even if the worst case scenario regarding this risk takes place, then we still survive this. We can still live with it. We can absorb it. This is accepting the risk. And then the last one, which can be a bit confusing, is avoiding the risk. Now, I want you to remember that avoiding the risk is not ignoring the risk. Those are co two completely different things. Avoiding the risk is an acceptable way of addressing a risk. When we say we want to avoid a risk, let's say these days we have the horrible virus in China, so I don't go to China because I want to avoid the risk of uh, getting infected by this virus but I don't ignore the risk of the virus and I don't go blind to China saying, hey, I'm not going to get it or I don't want to hear about it because, you know, if I don't hear about it, if I don't see it, then it doesn't exist. So this approach is more of the ignoring and uh, management should never ignore risks. They can avoid risks. They can say, OK, we're not doing this side of the business. 
until the landscape will be um, the landscape that we can we can live with. Uh, maybe fines can can be lower in a certain level. Maybe we can we, we even be uh, we can even be uh, uh, um, more mature uh, on a more mature level of, of security. Either way, uh, when we are avoiding the risk, it's done as a, a, a calculated decision uh, of management, senior management of addressing the risks. And then if we put everything on the map, <clears throat> um, we can see that the, the bottom line of risk handling for any management is to take a look at the overall map of risks and say, OK, this risk we can accept, this risk we're going to mitigate, and mitigating the risks mean we mean we're going to spend money on them and we're going to bring them down either probability or impact or both and then on this risk we're going to get an insurance coverage and then a certain risk we're just simply not going to do it for now but all risks together in the map of risks of the organization should be addressed by management if a risk is not addressed then it becomes even worse than than what it appears so in your questions if if a, a management decided to ignore a risk this is the worst situation and you don't want to be in that situation and you go and report on that and you basically manage uh, your risks as an individual within the senior management and um, uh, remember that for risk management in, as an overall that uh, discussions are very important around senior management uh, on how to address the risks uh, in any any one of the four ways. Um, the control assessments, when we decide to implement controls and, and, and address the risks or mitigate the risks, uh, there are two ways to measure the effectiveness of the investment. The investment of actually implementing controls because this costs money. And we have two terms that we need to remember. TCO, which is the total cost of ownership, which means this is the hard numbers value, monetary value of how much do I, uh, how much am I going to spend on implementing that control or a family of controls or a category of controls for that matter. And then we have the ROI, the return on investment. This, uh, the return on investment is easier to to calculate based on a, on a long uh, uh, timeline, which means years uh, of from from investment to the return on investment, and and these two are measured. The TCO is measured by dollars, and the ROI is measured by percentage. Uh, so my return on investment is 200% or 500% or 1000%. Uh, this is the ROI, and then this TCO is this and that amount of money that uh, the control will cost me in order to be effective and address the risk the way I want it to. So ROI again is typically easier to justify um, with uh, preventive controls uh, and detective controls are harder to justify with just the basic TCO and ROI calculations. So the preventive controls, uh, if you if you imagine this type of uh, uh, water machine, the, the, the preventive control is the uh, small button that we can press and stop the water from uh, pouring into the glass. But if something happens in this, this control, this little button doesn't work for us, then we have the countermeasure, the uh, uh, corrective control, if you may. So the preventive control is the control as they say uh, uh, in, in those CISSP questions. But when they talk about countermeasure, it, it means that you know something happened in the preventative control and then we need another control to compensate on that. And we will speak about compensated control soon. Um, so the countermeasure comes after preventative control uh, failed. Um, looking at the access controls and we talked about access controls and we will speak more in domain five about access controls access controls um, represent uh, over 90 percent of the security controls um, in any security programs uh, and, and isc knows that and they keep asking us about access control it can be physical access it can be logical access but access control is the number one control we want to address in security um, and since access control is the most important one, um, uh, knowing, uh, the, the, the realizing the fact that this control can be more uh, or implemented in more than one 
uh, um, uh, vector, which means that we can have administrative control, technical control, physical control, and the combination of controls. We can have preventative administrative controls or detective and physical control. Um, detective control and physical control means that we're going to have uh, probably a CCTV somewhere. Uh, and some uh, 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 watch guard uh, uh, actually monitoring this CCTV day and night 24-7. So this is the detective control, but the combination between the controls actually represents the proper access control or any type of control. So remember the combination between the controls that they can ask about. Now let's look at the three main three families of controls. The preventive control um, means that, uh, for example, we put a fence to stop the uh, unwanted uh, uh, personnel from passing through the, the that area and getting through uh, an, uh, an area which is restricted area. But preventive control, having a fence, is not deterrent control because the preventive control means that the control is there to actually prevent someone from doing something, while deterrent control means that it works on the psychology of the individual. So when you when you read a sign of, of for example, the no trespassing, this is not a preventive control. This is more of a deterrent control because if you if you pass this point, um, this sign can say you will be shot. And guess what happens when you cross that line? You don't get shot. So it's more of a deterrent control trying to uh, work on, a, on the brain of the individual while a fence saying, you know, don't cross that fence because it's, it's a, a, I don't know, a landmine there. Um, then, then, then if you cross that fence, unfortunately, you can um, meet uh, some horrible uh, uh, outcomes. So preventive control and deterrent controls are not the same, even though they direct that the same area of stopping someone from doing something. Now, when preventive control failed, and any preventive control is expected to fail at the end of the day, then what we want to do first is to detect, to know about it, to know that our preventive control failed. And the detective control comes after prevention. OK, so when you do detection, now it's important to have a very short uh, period of time of when you say, OK, is this an event? Is this an incident? Is this a cyber Armageddon? And then make a decision because the next one is that you want to move to the corrective uh, path of when preventive control failed. You detected this failure and now you want to fix it. Fixing it is addressing it with logical control or physical controls, administrative controls, any type of control that can help you go back in, in your business, go back to normal. Um, so the goal of the co corrective controls is to bring business back to normal. It doesn't mean that uh, IT will go back to normal, and we will speak about that in domain seven when we we'll talk about security operations and disaster recovery but it means that the business can actually continue making money. And we said the businesses care about businesses, so businesses want to make money. Um, and this is this is the idea behind the corrective control. Now, we, we can have many other controls, for example, the tearing control or discourages controls, uh, 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 discouraging control and compensating control, which means that we, uh, uh, we cannot implement a certain control, so we implement another control on another set of controls to or, uh, overcome this gap that we have from uh, uh, not being able to implement that specific control. And then recovery controls uh, are meant to restore the operation uh, of any system to the, the normal level of that system. So that will be the additional type of controls, but the main three are preventive, detective, and corrective. Preventive will fail. We want to know about this with detective, and then we want to address it with corrective controls. I, I hope it makes sense. Um, and then the combination between the controls, preventive, I give you a, a couple of examples here. Uh, for example, preventative and administrative control. This is, for example, uh, having a, uh, uh, your employees uh, screen before you hire them. That means that you, you, know, you, can, you can run the drug tests on all employees uh, and, and get them to go through admi uh, certain administrative 
path uh, in order for you to prevent uh, your, your organization from hiring the wrong people. So this is preventative and administrative control, but preventive and technical control can be a smart card or a proximity card. Uh, again, it should prevent someone from logging into your system if they're not authorized, if they don't have the card. And this is a technical control, which can also be in your CSSP exam, logical control. So technical can be logical. And then preventive control and physical control uh, combined is uh, your fence, uh, your eight-fold tall fence with three standard bar barbed wires, uh, which we will meet in domain three, any type of environmental control, temperature, humidity uh, for availability of your systems can be your preventive administrative control. Now, when we talk about detective and technical control, this is easy. This is basically your SIM system or any type of correlation of logs that can tell you a story that you have a, a potential cyber incident here and there in your organization. So this is your detection side of business of, of controls that tells you a story using the technical capabilities or logical capabilities. Uh, so for that uh, area, let's, let's put this to rest that in risk management, we first need to identify the risk assess the risk using the hybrid approach of qualitative and quantitative risk analysis together. And remember the whiteboard that we had there for the quantitative risk analysis with all the equations. And then we need to decide on how to address the risk and bring most, if not all risks, um, to a certain level of, of acceptance. Uh, and that level is directed by your senior management. And uh, at the end of the day, senior management needs to decide on all risks uh, with the four options of uh, mitigating the risks, transferring the risks, uh, accepting the risk, or avoiding the risks. And again, not never ignoring the risks. So if you have a question that says CEO directs you not to run a risk assessment here or there, and risk, uh, CEO directs you not to run your penetration tests on this and that system, this is, this is a risk ignorance or this is ignoring the risk and this is wrong. Um, so this is a bad situation. Avoiding the risks mean, means that the CEO can say, okay, you, you, you uh, uh, run your pen testing and now your system says that you have a certain uh, level of risk and we cannot we cannot live with this we cannot we cannot address it this year so let's let's try to address it next year this is avoiding the risk um and then when you when you plan on mitigating the risks uh that means that you're planning on on a, a implementing controls and you need to justify them using the tcr or roi and then um, those controls can be preventive, detective, or corrective, or any type of combination between these three and administrative, physical, and, and technical controls. So this is basically wrapping up the whole risk management uh, of domain one. And I can attest that in the CSSP, we will always go back to this basics of risk management. What are we uh, addressing here. What is the risk management question that we have here in front of us uh, in the CSSP that we need to address using this uh, uh, path that I just mentioned in the past couple of minutes. Next chapter in our book uh, is the business continuity planning. And this one should be easy because it's, um, it's relatively um, uh, easy to understand if you remember the four main steps of uh, uh, business continuity planning. So remember that business continuity planning objective is to have uh, your organization ready for an emergency situ situation in your business, not in your IT, never in your IT. The IT is addressed the IT emergencies are addressed with the DRP, Business Disaster Recovery Planning, which we will mention again in Domain 7. This is not the DRP. The BCP is about making, continue making money in the organization. How can the organization keep on making money even though an emergency happens? 
And these are the four steps that you need to consider. First, you need to project scope and planning, as in any project, you need to scope that and plan that ahead. And then you run the business impact analysis, which means that you ask yourself which uh, system or technology is important for our business. Uh, and then uh, the continuity planning itself, and then the approval and implementation again with senior management. But uh, before I continue on this, let me check the chat room. Uh, because I forgot them doing that uh, before. So let's check the, the chat room and see if we have any questions there. Um, um, no, Michael, Alex, I see you all. Corey, thank you. Um, all right. Um, let's go back to our business continuity. Okay, so these are the four steps of business continuity planning. Um, the first step, the project scope and planning, is uh, uh, structured from four uh, sub-steps. Uh, the first one is structural analysis of the business organization. So we want to know what the business is doing. We want to learn about the business. Even though we are from the business or, or someone from the business hired us to do the work, we want to ask questions on what is the business doing. Uh, and then the creation of the BCP team, remember that we need to make sure that the bu business is uh, busy doing making money uh, and do what they know how to do uh, and the team should ref, uh, reflect on this uh, or, or this should reflect on the, the choice of the team, the right choice of the team. And then the assessment of the resources available, so not in every organization uh, management will be able to provide the resources they say that should be there for the business continuity and we need to work with what we have. And um, uh, uh, a lot of my students uh, hear me say that uh, even a zero is a budget and we need to work with that budget. Uh, zero is a number. And then uh, finally, we need to analyze the legal and regulatory landscape of the organization. And this is obvious because we want to obey the law, but also under this one falls everything that is contractual agreement. So our organization works with clients and we are obligated contractually, we're obligated to work with our clients and provide them with the services regardless of our IT uh, uh, landscape and IT disasters, again, which are addressed with the DRP. They don't care if something happened, something major, something catastrophic happened in our organization, they can be sympathizing with 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 uh, uh, with uh, our situation, but at the end of the day, they need us to provide that service, or they will go to our competitors, or they will, or worse, uh, their business will be affected. So let's look at this one by one again. Business organization analysis. We want to understand the business, the, what the business does, and what is important for the business. If you may, this this is uh, prioritization of the business. Uh, units or the business functions and this will lead us to choosing the right business continuity team. The business continuity team, any business continuity team in your CISSP should include this five core members. The first one is representative from each of the operational support departments. This can be from the CISO uh, office, this can be uh, anyone from uh, facilities, uh, and then the other one is technical expert from IT department, since IT supports the business. IT is never the business, even in IT related businesses, IT in those businesses supports the business. And then security personnel with BCP skills. Uh, this is uh, 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 in the CISSP relates to the R, type of security personnel, uh, the uh, logical or cybersecurity personnel. Uh, and this comes from, from the fact that uh, a lot of emergencies can start in uh, IT, can start in uh, uh, the uh, virtual environment of the organization because many of organizations rely on data and rely on machines to work for them to do their business. And when this is down and where this is uh, attacked, then they need the security personnel uh, with the right skills to help them address it. And then, and then legal representatives. This is really important for the, uh, uh, again, uh, the reasons that I mentioned before, uh, corporate legal regulatory uh, um, frameworks, but also contractual obligations uh, or responsibilities that we have. And then Last but not least, and remember that in your CISSP, you always need to have 
a representative from senior management in the room when you do business continuity, uh, because they are the ones to help you push the BCP efforts in your organization. Say a disaster happened and, and you know something bad happened to the organization. Well, they all want to go back to business, but there are certain doors that you cannot open when you're the CISO. Um, even even if you're a very respected uh, CISO, very high, uh, uh, highly appreciated CISO, still you're not uh, the deputy uh, uh, of your CEO. You're not the CEO, you're not the CFO, and maybe those individuals can help you open doors that are shut for you. Uh, so this will be will bring you to the right team. And then the resource requirements, you ask yourself, what are the resources, people, process, and technologies in your resources? Do you have the, amount, the right amount of money to run the disaster uh, uh, or the continuity planning uh, for that matter? Do you have any commitment for a certain hardware or software or employees with certain skills uh, that you rely on? And this is the resource analysis. And then, as mentioned, the legal and regulatory requirements uh, that you always want to have someone from your legal department with you helping you doing this planning because you know you can read the books you can read the laws you can read the regulations but uh, the legal department will help you understand or better understand what it is that they can protect you or protect the business with and what it is that they cannot and those are the risks that needs to be addressed before the BCP takes place. And then after understanding the business, we want to understand the importance of every business function. This is what we call business impact assessment. So we want to measure the impact on the business from any type of machine or any type of system or any type of service that can be considered critical for the, the business. This can be based on quantitative decision making or qualitative decision making, very much like the risk assessment or the risk analysis that we saw previously. And then the five steps toward the BIA is basically asking the question of risks. What are the priorities? What are the risks identified? What are the like? What is the likelihood of that to happen? What is what would be the impact for that if that will happen? What are the resources that I can work with in order to address the risk? So uh, this will be basically the controls that I can work with. Um, and then the continuity planning, which is the third step uh, toward the business continuity planning. This is basically when you sit down and write your um, your plan. Uh, you develop your strategy, you provision the processes and you get the approval and you schedule um, uh, uh, the, the, the work plan around your uh, business continuity with all the resources, relevant resources and personnel uh, that will take training in order for them to uh, train before it happens. So be proactive in your business continuity. The fourth step is the approval and implementation. So all these four steps will take place before the disaster or emergency happens. I hope it makes sense because we want to plan for the emergency. We want we don't want to uh, uh, work when when it happens because it will not be effective. So senior management needs to approve everything that happened. And um, this is highly recommended regardless of the CISSP document everything. Don't just leave things in your head. Don't just go or follow the it's in my head syndrome because this will not help you look good in times of emergencies. If you have things in your head, you might as well forget some of them, maybe even critical functions that you can forget. And then you're in trouble as much as the, uh, the, the business is in trouble, but also you as a, an individual is in trouble. So document everything, bring it in front of your uh, senior management, get the approval, get their consent, and get the the uh, the most important thing, get their support. Um, and then when we do the uh, business continuity planning, when we actually write a plan uh, and work with the team and choose the team members of the plan, there can be some people in our team, and this will be in, in the CIS, this is actually in the CISSP, people in the business continuity team or stakeholders around the business continuity 
that will say, don't worry about this, I got this covered, or I have a gut feeling or a hunch that uh, will help us get through this. So you want to avoid that. And in this CISSP, it's called sit of the pence syndrome. This is someone that will give you the, uh, with the full self-confidence, that will give you all the promises in the world that they can fix whatever happens to the business because they know it all and they've been there for 40 years and they can, you know, fix it all for us. Uh, so we want to avoid that. We want to have everything in business continuity officialized and, and approved by the business and brought in front of the uh, senior management in order for them to team up with us and be ready for that moment that we will ring the bells and say something bad happened. And then in order for us to not rely on specific individuals, not rely on just one individual with the key for the safe, with the plan of the business continuity, we want to do cross training. So training is important in BCP because this is a BCP by itself, training your people. This is creating redundancy. So it's making sure that there is a business continuity for the business continuity plan. Um, and this one is um, the uh, chapter three, uh, again, which covered the business continuity plan. Very short chapter, very easy to remember. If you remember the first, uh, the initial four uh, steps toward the, the uh, business continuity. And I highly recommend them memorizing those four steps and try to work with uh, the questions around that. Remember those four steps, those four steps are not, I, I, I do not consider them as a whiteboard, but they're very important to address the questions of the business continuity. There, there will be questions in, on business continuity, A, because it's important, B, because uh, uh, in previous years, this used to be the business continuity used to be a domain by itself, and ISC will not want to lose those questions that they already have in their databases. Uh, addressing the uh, business continuity. So I highly recommend them, again, going back to those four steps and uh, looking at the way uh, they're built and the uh, logic behind them, and then uh, um, uh, address those questions using those four steps. Uh, last chapter for domain one. Um, we're almost done with uh, domain one. Uh, and the last chapter is the uh, chapter about laws, regulations, and compliance. So if you remember when we started this bootcamp, we talked about governance and the, the word governance means that this is basically how we operate in our organization. So if you may, this is uh, a governance or, or security governance is the book of law or book of rules on security inside the organization. They can be external uh, uh, um, uh, vectors or, or external uh, um, uh, entities that will uh, put laws and regulations and standards on the organization on how to do security. They can be uh, a law, for example, the HIPAA uh, for protecting the uh, protected health uh, information. Uh, they can be the Privacy Act of 1974 that will direct us to protect the PII, personally identifiable information. Those are all the laws. And then we can have regulations. The regulations can be um, anything related to a certain industry. Uh, for example, the GLBA, which speaks about financial institutes. Uh, and it's a law for specific industries. Uh, again, those are two, those two are tied by the regulations will be uh, implemented on organizations and not on the individuals. Uh, the same thing we see with the GDPR, for example, which is a regulation on of organizations on how to protect individuals' uh, privacy or, or personal data. And then the compliance framework, which can come from standards, much like the ISO 27001, PCI DSS, but also internal standards, for example, policies and procedures, and uh, security strategy or business strategies and overall. Um, so these are the frameworks uh, for all this um, uh, compliance uh, area or governance area um, for that matter in the CISSP. Um, looking at laws, um, <clears throat> in, in the, uh, uh, the American approach of, of laws, we have this basic three in the CISSP. Uh, the criminal law is anything that can point out a crime, 
or a criminal, and a violation of those laws can uh, uh, negate or uh, uh, take away a certain freedom of a person, of an individual. So, in order to do that, in order to achieve that, 99% certainty is not enough to pursue an, an individual, uh, to send them to jail. We need to get to 100% because this is this is harsh, this is bad. A person can lose their, 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 fun, their, their money, uh, their freedom, uh, um, you know, any, any assets they have, um, and they can go to jail. And this is serious business. The civil law is basically the laws uh, that we we will most likely to use in computer uh, uh, computerized let's call it argument or or um, any uh, uh, disagreements between two parties. Uh, in, or, in order for us to win the case in court, all we need to do is prove that 51 percent uh, of the uh, um, uh, evidence or or supporting story is on our side. 51% is enough uh, because we win it by, by weight. Uh, and then we have in the CISSP the administrative laws, and this is important to remember. The administrative laws are used in the US for government agency. It's used for government agency to effectively carry out their day-to-day -day business. So it's not any law for any individual, it's the laws for the government on how to operate, on what we expect them to do. So most of your CISSP questions or most of the CISSP focus will be around civil law, but you also need to be familiarized with the criminal law and understand the administrative laws as well for the government. Um, let's look at some major laws um, designed to, to protect uh, against computer crime. The first one is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, uh, and this one um, meant to protect the computers used by the government um, from abuse by anyone outside the government, so hackers that want to uh, hack the government. So uh, if the government wants to pursue those hackers and they, let's say they, they catch them, they catch them right red-handed, they want to bring them to court, bring them to justice, they will operate under this, uh, they will uh, uh, charge them under the CFAA. The CSA, the CSA, the Computer Security Act, um, now takes the responsibility to the government itself on how to protect its own systems from attacks. So it's not enough just to say, you're the government, you're strong, you can pursue others that are trying to uh, um, uh, attack you, but you also need to do to take certain steps in order to protect your systems from getting attacked. So this is under the CSA. And then the Government Information Security Reform Act uh, says that uh, in the US, government agencies, any government agencies, and there are over 84,000 government agencies in the US alone, they all need to have a security program including planning, assessment, and protection. And uh, also, uh, under this Reform Act, they are required to have an individual that actually manage uh, uh, um, uh, security for them. So think about all the job opportunities that you have with the US government, uh, all your CISSPs or future CISSPs out there. Um, and I encourage you to, to apply and see how far you can get. Um, the Economic Espionage Act of 1996 means that, uh, says that uh, uh, the, any espionage act against um, uh, organizations in the US will cause, uh, will bring uh, penalties for individuals for uh, the accusation of theft, theft of trade secrets. And we will talk about trade secrets soon. But if you go and um, uh, act on, on uh, as an es uh, espionage under this act and transfer the information to another uh, organization or another government, another foreign government, which is not in the US, not a US government, then you can be accused with criminal laws and get even harsher penalties uh, by doing that. Um, the Privacy Act of 1974 uh, says that, you know, every individual has the right for privacy and we are all, this is something we want to protect uh, uh, individuals. So if we collect in, uh, information about individuals as an organization, we need to comply with this law and make sure that the PII 
personally identifiable information is protected from manipulation and disclosure and um, destruction. So the uh, DAD, if you remember the CIA versus the DAD, so the disclosure, alteration, and destruction. So how do we protect that? We, we implement uh, uh, controls for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, the GDPR uh, of 2018, um, one year and a half ago, uh, was uh, brought to enforcement and, and basically says the, the same thing as the HIPAA and many other uh, privacy regulations before that said, uh, but this one kind of turned the table to say uh, now the, the, the individual has more power than the organization because all they need to do is submit a complaint about the organization saying the organization violated my privacy and we have certain rights for individuals that we need to take under consideration. Under the GDPR, we have six uh, rights of the individual, including accessing the records, uh, 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 correcting the records and even asking the organization to erase the, those records. It's called the right to erasure or quote unquote the right to be forgotten. Um, but international laws uh, come with a lot of challenges because uh, looking at the map of the world, you can see that you know we are divided by geographical boundaries. We are divided by cultural boundaries, by religious boundaries and we do not work as one against criminals. And criminals, um, uh, the, the uh, cyber criminals, they use that against organizations and they use the fact that you know, law enforcement do not cope, uh, necessarily cope and work together in order to pursue them. And this creates a challenge for law enforcement and, and us at CISSP. So if you're asked if uh, what is the number one challenge in international laws, uh, it's the lack of cooperation between countries and, and agencies. Uh, even though we see that improving over time, but still it's very challenging to pursue a hacker that is in a foreign country. Um, then the uh, the other topic, the, I think it's the last topic that we will discuss about today, uh, and in this domain, the domain one, is the uh, intellectual properties pr uh, protection. So there are four of them, uh, copyright, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. Um, so looking at copyrights, copyrights are meant to protect every um, creation of an individual. Um, that can be a book, it can be an article, poems, songs, anything that you create uh, from nothing. For example, this presentation is protected. As you can see down here, it's uh, uh, copyright protected presentation, so you cannot use that without the authorization of the creator. Um, and uh, for this one, for the copyright, we have an act or a law in the US that they put together in 1998. It's called the G Digital, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which then limited the liability of ISPs, the internet service providers, back to the time when people downloaded uh, MP3 and violated many rights of many uh, artists uh, and violated many copyrights of many artists back in the 90s. Uh, trademarks are the symbols behind uh, a certain uh, product or a certain company. That can be a name of a company, a slogan, uh, uh, any type of logo, any type of uh, uh, description that relates with that product or this company um, and, and that can be anything that uh, triggers the um, potential client to actually understand that oh this is this is McDonald's this is uh, uh, Starbucks and I'm gonna buy this now uh, and I relate to the product I relate to that uh, um, to this company so this is a trademark this is how we mark our uh, company. And then patents and what they can ask you about patents. And they, they, they tell us a lot of stories about patents in the book. Some of them are not relevant, but as, as mentioned before, you need to, to get familiar with the book as a whole uh, because the, the exam will be about the book. But in patents, most of the questions, most of the times they will ask you, what uh, is the length of protection that you can expect from a patent because patent is not for life. Patent uh, protection is for only 20 years and those 20 years the countdown starts 
for when you file the request for a patent protection. So let's say you file the request today, 2020, and in three years you get your patent number. And in between now and 2023, you get a patent pending number. The count of those 20 years of protection starts today and will end in 2040. So not from not a 2043. Okay, so remember that the protection is 20 years from filing date. And then the trade secret, trade secret is the secrets of any company, any organization of how they make their money. For example, Coca-Cola uh, trade secrets are uh, on the formula of how they make this awesome or horrible, you make the choice, drink. Um, they obviously do very well because they're in the market for many years now and they, they their sales are con constantly going up um, and uh, there's a secret behind this. Uh, so how do they do that? Let's say an employee that is familiarized with the secret goes out and sells these secrets to another firm. That means that now this employee violated the trust that this company uh, put in, in them in their position and they now uh, created another competitor uh, using the secret. So uh, in order for us to protect ourselves from trade secrets of leaking uh, uh, from, from the company, we normally use the NDA. So this can relate to any type of business, any uh, any type of company that does something special, unique about their work that they don't want to be uh, 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 disclosed to, to, to anyone in order to create competitors. So uh, by protecting those uh, trade secrets, um, you can uh, um, number the copies of hard uh, um, documents, hard, uh, uh, so uh, documents that you, you printed out and um, uh, so you can have a secured storage, you can have uh, controlled distribution of information, say emails, you can uh, use the um, um, D DRM, the data right management system in your Outlook, for example, to control the copies or what the um, recipients can do with whatever you send them. And of course, um, documents such as the NDA that you can put in place. Last slide for today, the code of ethics of ISC squared. So um, this is important. Before you take your CISSP exam, as you register online for the CISSP, you mark this. This, you, this is a checkbox in the process of registration to your toward your CISSP exam that you need to check in order for you to proceed with the process that you actually read the code of ethics of ISC and you agree with them. Because if you don't agree with them, then they don't want to do business with you. They don't want you to take the exam and get certified if you don't, if you're not in line with their code of ethics. The code of ethics of an ISC um, means that you need to protect the society and the commonwealth and the infrastructure of you know everyone in security. You act honorably, uh, honestly, justly, responsibly, uh, and legally, and you provide diligent and competent services to the principals and advance and protect the profession. For example, this bootcamp that I do with you now uh, is advancement and protection of the profession. I enhance the uh, spirit of ISC and the way we do things uh, uh, in the security business, the cybersecurity business. Now, you need to read that and you need to accept and agree to it as you register for the exam. And this is important. In your exam, you will have at least one question from the code of ethics. This question can be important because some says, and I'm not, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but this might be a myth, might be not a myth, but you don't want to risk it with your $700 of registration for the exam, that if you get this question wrong, that means that you didn't read the code of ethics or a couple of questions. If you got them wrong, then you don't pass the exam. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is something I read on Facebook. So, you know, you make your, your choices. Uh, it's not too long, but read it before you register for the exam. And this is it, everybody. This is domain one of uh, CSSP. Next week, we start domain two. Domain two will be relatively quick and easy. Uh, it's the asset security. 
uh, and it's the way we classify the information and a little bit about technology, uh, emphasizing hardware capabilities on how to protect data and how to uh, maintain the data on, on those uh, hardware uh, uh, devices. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, ROM uh, uh, um, uh, chipsets and, and RAM and EEPROM and flash drives and, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, see you again next week, everybody, and thank you for a wonderful time tonight. Have a great evening and uh, talk to you next week. Bye-bye.